Good morning, church. Let's stand together as we sing out in praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. I can feel it already this morning. Let's sing out to him on this Palm Sunday. as we're heading into Easter. First of all, welcome to worship everyone today. Thank you for being here on this Palm Sunday. We're having all of our regular 11 a.m. programming today. There's something for everybody from nursery on up. So be sure to make a point to uh, start attending one of those classes if you are not already attending one. Tomorrow night, Monday night, not a lot of us are in the habit of coming to church on a Monday. So don't forget, if you signed up for the Seder, which is tomorrow night, in this room, to come to it. If you did not sign up and you're feeling really bad about that because you meant to, the RSVP is closed. But Lisa said, if you want to come, we can probably find a way to fit you in. We'll scooch, we'll share, we'll find a way. If you know that right now, tell Lisa so she can start thinking it through. But we'd really, really like it if everybody who wants to be there is there. All right, so then you're here on Monday. 
And just a few days later, it's Good Friday. We'll be having a Good Friday service right here at 7 p.m. Matt Hyatt and I will be leading together a time of quiet, reverent, acoustic worship. And we hope that everyone will come to that as well. And then Sunday morning, we'll have our Easter service at 9.30 a.m. Darren's going to talk to you a little bit more about that in a few minutes. And then after the service, we are having an egg hunt for all students from birth to through high school, it's gonna be really fun. And another part of Easter is that we wanna have our tulips up here lining the stage. And that's where you all come in because you are making a $10 donation if you like to um, receive a tulip pot. The tulips will all be up here during the service and then when the service is over, uh, you can come and get your tulip. And if you want some of those, Come meet me at the table in the back, and we'll get you signed up to receive the tulips. After Easter, we will be offering the Alpha Course. And the Alpha Course is an 11-week series that explores the Christian faith. And each session looks at a different question regarding the faith and is designed for conversation. So if you are a new believer, if you are a seeker, maybe trying to figure out what all of this is about, maybe you've been around for a really long time and you've learned these things since you were a kid and now you have some questions that you'd like a little bit of clarification on with your adult, more mature brain. Alpha is a great way to talk about things that are you've been wondering about, a great way even as longtime strong believers to deepen your faith. So we'll be scheduling that after Easter. So I'd like you all to be thinking about whether or not uh, you should be a part of that and I'd also like you to be thinking about someone you might want to invite who maybe has been asking you a lot of questions about the Christian faith we can all kind of work together and uh, discover the answers to those things so think about Alpha our guest preacher today wink wink guest is um, how many years do you have to be here that you're not called a guest preacher when you're preaching Bob because you've been here for you started attending in 1985, I think. Well, anyway, Bob's our guest preacher today, and he'll be bringing us the sermon. But before that, we have a wonderful opportunity to have our traditional Palm Sunday kids processional. And it's special for the last couple of years the way we've been doing it. Our kids will be processing. You'll stay seated. And they will be coming up to you and uh, collecting the canned food that you may have decided to bring today. So as we are loving God, we are also loving others with our canned food Palm Sunday processional. And with that, we want to read today's sermon scripture that Bob will be teaching from that will also help us put into context what we're doing with the Palm Sunday processional. John 12, 12 to 16. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. In your presence, all I 
going to continue raising our Ebenezer as we uh, get those things stacked up there.
praise you, Lord. Like a ring of solid gold, like a vow that is tested, like a covenant of old, and your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today. can continue as long as you need to keep doing that. No, not you. And um, we are getting ready now to take our offering. <laughs> 
If you would like to give as the baskets go around, please feel free to do that. You can also give online at emmanuelburbank.churchcenter.com, or you can use the QR codes in the seat back pockets in front of you. And with that, Darren Shea is going to bring us a special announcement and then pray for the offering. Good morning. Good morning. The Holy Spirit is here today. Just a little bit of housekeeping, as I'm sure we're all aware, next Sunday is Easter. And in light of that, we are expecting a wonderful and packed house. So it is my humblest request to you all, if you wouldn't mind, if when you get here and first take your seats, if everyone would just kind of try to congregate to the front and and pack in, get up next to your neighbor, put your arm around them, tell them how much you love them, and that you're so glad to see them. What that does, it allows for people, as, especially guests as they come in, they can, we can, you know, the ushers can sit them on the aisles and in the back, and it just makes the service so much smoother. I know there's a few people that you need to be on the end of the aisle. If you do, no problem. Uh, there'll be ushers to kind of help direct and get people in the right seats, but for the most part, if you can, if you can kind of squinch in and tell your neighbor how much you love them, that would be awesome. <laughs> can we all do that? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come to you today just humbled and, and incredibly grateful with hearts of gratitude that this offering and tithes that we're about to receive, Lord, that they just be pressed together and, and shaken and multiplied so that they impact not only our church body, but this community of Burbank, the state of California, and really all over the world, Lord. And through this process that you would just be glorified and we would be able to see your work just go throughout this world. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
If they're, uh, if they're still, if they're still children here, we have to dismiss you to go to your Sunday school classes. We thank you for your service today. It's great uh, to be a guest preacher this morning. <laughs> I did a little calculation while we were sitting here, and I figured I've probably preached at least 40 times the last 20 years, but uh, it's great to be a guest. You're also welcoming. <laughs> Hopefully by now it's obvious that it's Palm Sunday. Nothing says Palm Sunday like barely awake children waving sharp palm fronds in your face. Um, it is always one of the uh, highlights of the year for me to see the children uh, and some of the teenagers uh, celebrate with us and also marked by the wonderful generosity. The church is always so responsive that way. Many of us have been here long enough to see some of these little babies that used to walk in Palm Sunday are now grown. It's a wonderful testimony to the generation that we, we have here at Emmanuel. You know, um, for many of us, Palm Sunday memories, uh, to me, conjure up flannel boards. Early Sunday school experiences, seeing the flannels, uh, characters go up on the flannel board. But Palm Sunday is really an extraordinary moment in the life of our church and life of Jesus. It's uh, one of the few stories in the Bible that is repeated in all four Gospels. It was included in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And Palm Sunday is uh, the beginning of what I've often called Holy Week or the Passion Week. In this time in history that we start with Palm Sunday today, several of the most important events in human history occurred in a short period of time. Following Palm Sunday, there was the Last Supper, Jesus meeting with his disciples. There was his final prayer to his father, uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane and all that came with that. There was his arrest and the eventual trial and his sentence to death. Of course, his crucifixion, which we acknowledge on Good Friday. And then, of course, finally, the resurrection. What we refer to as Easter Sunday. All of these events are remembered and celebrated this week by all forms of Christian churches around the world, whether whatever kind of denomination they're established, wherever country they are, people from all over the world this week are united in remembering and celebrating the, the events of Holy Week culminating in Easter. When I thought about this week, I, I don't think it's insignificant that this is the exact kind of unity that Jesus prayed for in the Garden of Gethsemane that's outlined in John 17, that he would ask that his church would be unified. And this is a week where in many cases it really, really is. Now I'm gonna be the first one to admit that Palm Sunday can be just a bit confusing because I don't quite know how to feel on Palm Sunday. I know how I'm supposed to feel on Good Friday. I mean, that's a sobering day. It's a, it's a remembering, a reflection of the horror of the crucifixion. Really, um, um, it is a day of often uh, sadness and sorrow as we reflect on that. Um, I know how to feel on Easter Sunday. That is a day of resurrection, a day of celebration, a day of happiness, a day when the whole church proclaims he has risen but how are we supposed to feel on Palm Sunday? Are we supposed to feel happy or sad? On one hand, the text tells us 
of this marvelous, joyous celebration where Jesus was greeted in a wonderful way with shouts of Hosanna and palm um, leaves laid on the ground and cloaks laid on the ground as he entered into Jerusalem. It appears to be a very happy event, a real, uh, real parade, a happy parade. On the other hand, we know that Jesus is knowingly and voluntarily moving towards a terrible ordeal in Jerusalem. He knows that he'll be arrested. He'll be guilty of offenses uh, that he's brought up against, uh, false charges by the Roman government and the Jewish leaders of the day. He knows what the punishment for this will be, crucifixion. And we know that he was heading to something that is sorrow, sorrowful. He also knows that many of the followers that are celebrating him on the road to Jerusalem will eventually turn against him and betray him. So, are we supposed to feel happy or sad about Palm Sunday? Well, for most of us, it can just be confusing until we take the long view, the historical view of, of this day. So to understand what's going on with Jesus on Palm Sunday, we have to understand a little bit of the context and what is going on in this moment in history in the scriptures. There is a complex historical, political, and religious chess game being played at this time in history. Um, at the same time, while all that's going on in the, in the politics of the day, at the same time, God is orchestrating some of the central plans and central parts of his eternal plan for all creation and all mankind. This is all happening simultaneously, unaware of most people not knowing what's really going on. And in this story, there are basically three casts of characters that are all involved. Each one of these groups or cast of characters, for most cases, there are things they know and many things that they don't know. We call the unknowns. So let's take a look a little bit at these cast of characters. The first one is what I call the religious and political leaders of the day. What is known and understood by them? Well, plenty of things. They know, the religious leaders know, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the, the, the leaders of the Jewish uh, people in Jerusalem know that this prophet, this new person on the scene, Jesus Christ, is a threat to their authority, and he has to be stopped. We know that they are really setting a trap for him that will lead to his arrest and trial. But they also know that they don't have the legal authority to sentence Jesus to death. They need the Roman government to do that. They don't have the ability to do it, but they're, part of their plot is to convince the Roman leaders that Jesus deserves this death penalty. Now, the political leaders of Rome know that this is the Passover week. Thousands of Jews from all over the world at the time will be coming to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. So they're pretty sensitive to the fact this is not the group you want to get upset during this week. So you can see behind the scenes all of these political things happening. Um, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that Sunday uh, before Passover, he set in place a complex plot between the religious and political leaders. They, these leaders that I'm talking about re represented the highest form of power in Jerusalem. Combination of religious and political, they had all the power at that. They thought they knew what was going on. They had a plan. But what they did not know was they were really just pawns in the eternal plan of the sovereign God. And their actions in this week would re be recorded in history forever. We know that. They did not know that. Well, the next part of our story, the most important central part of this story, is Jesus himself. What did he know? Well, he knew by entering Jerusalem that he was a terrible threat to the leaders of the day, Jewish leaders. He knew that it was Passover and there'd be hundreds of followers. 
He knew that he was going to be betrayed by one of his closest disciples and that he would be unfairly arrested and convicted. We knew, he knew, that he was riding towards his ultimate destiny, the cross. Yet with all of this known, he still obediently rode into Jerusalem. I don't think there's anything about these events that, that he knew um, that he did not know about. But one thing that he did was to send a clear message. By riding into to Jerusalem on a donkey was a message. And we know that this was intentional and important because the gospel accounts of Palm Sunday clearly state that he sent two of his followers ahead in Jerusalem to find a donkey for him to ride in. So there was an intentionality about getting that donkey. Now, why is this important? Why is this a part of the story that Jesus knew, but very few other people did not know? Well, the first reason was to fulfill biblical prophecy. The prophet Zechariah wrote these words, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly riding on, the, on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Excuse me. Those are pretty clear words written hundreds and hundreds of years before this event. And those who knew the Jewish history and those who were waiting for the Messiah were familiar with this passage. But the second reason he chose a donkey was to send a clear message to everyone, especially those who were following and paying attention, about who he was and who he was not. Because the tradition of the day was that if a king or a general from another place rode into a capital city like Jerusalem, but they rode on a large horse, regaled with all the regalia that is on it, followed by soldiers, that it was a clear message that this king, this leader, was coming for conquest. It was a signal that war was coming, a signal that there was going to be a toppling of a government of some sort. So in those days, if people found out that was happening way down the road, they were getting ready for something to happen. But the same tradition says that if this leader, this general, whoever it is, came in riding a donkey, that it sent a different message. And that message was that he was coming in submission and for peace. He was not coming to be the conqueror. He was coming for the point of establishing peace. And one of the things Jesus finally knew in this story is that by riding in on a donkey, he was about to disappoint and confuse the hundreds of people who thought they knew who he was, but they didn't. Which makes us transition to the third group of people called the regular people, the people who greeted him in the story. In contrast to the political elite of the day and the Son of God himself, this was the largest group in the story. These were regular people that gathered to welcome into Jerusalem. These were regular people, mostly poor and powerless oppressed Jews. Now, the story, the scriptures tell us that his entrance into Jerusalem occurred sometime um, after the raising of Lazarus from the dead. That word got around. (laughs) That was part of the reasons the crowds came, was, okay, who is this person, and is he our deliverer? Um, So these people... Again, in your minds, not the elite, not the powerful, but the regular folks, the ones who were looking for some kind of help, some kind of hope from the oppression they were under. They confirmed their faith in Jesus. They confirmed their hope in Jesus um, by 
practicing a tradition that was common if a person was come to be a king or a liberator. And that tradition was to lay cloaks on the ground and palms on the ground so this person would literally ride over them. So they thought they knew that Jesus was. They thought he knew. They thought he was the long prophesied Messiah who was coming to deliver these people from the oppression of the Romans. Though he did not look like a military leader or even a king, people were aware of the miracles that he had done and, he was, and that he was going to establish a kingdom forever. These people, the Jewish people at the time, had a long history. They, uh, they told them what happened, that this had happened before with the deliverance of Moses from the Egyptians and then the rule of King David, who was a king that ruled over. So they had this all in context and belief and also believed that they thought the Messiah was coming. And most importantly, they thought that, they, that Jesus was there to save them. This is characterized by the chant Hosanna. Hosanna literally translates, he saves us. So you're feeling all this happening at this time. But these same people would soon find out the celebration of what was happening on that road to Jerusalem was a misunderstanding of what they thought they knew, but they didn't. And these regular people eventually became quite disappointed in Jesus. In fact, the scriptures tell us that many of these people who were singing and praising his praises in Jerusalem just a few days later would be calling for his crucifixion. The reason was, most for some of them, he was turning out to be not who they thought he was going to be. You know, it was the unknowns that were most confusing and most profound uh, to the people at the time. They, don't, they did not know at that time what God the Father and Jesus the Son knew. That Jesus was the Messiah. That he was the long-promised promised Savior. That he did come to save them. But he was going to save them from a greater enemy than Rome. They were, he was saving them from the ravages of the evil one, the ravages of sin, the ravages of brokenness. And not only was he here to save them, that this salvation that they were looking for would not only be for them, it would be for all people in all places over all time. That's what they didn't know. John 12, 13, uh, uh, 30, John 12, 31 says this, Jesus' words. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Now these are words he spoke to people. And I, my guess is that it didn't register in the way that he thought. <laughs> Follow, um, God the Father and Jesus the Son knew what Jesus stated in John 12 again. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. He was pro uh, prophesying and pointing out that though people wanted him to be a savior of them circumstances at the moment, that would have a short shelf life. <laughs> but what he came to do was to provide the salvation for all people. The many, many seeds were multiplied. It was not God's plan that Jesus would be an earthly king with an earthly kingdom who would give temporary historical relief to oppressed people. You may remember at the temptation of Jesus, one of the things that Satan tempted Jesus with was, you can be the king of this whole world. It wasn't good enough for him. 
But it was God's plan that Jesus be the king of kings, of the kingdom of God that will have no end. All humanity will have access to this eternal kingdom. All humanity will have the ability to be forever free from the influence and the bondage of evil and the judgment of sin. But because these people were confused and disappointed by the, no, by the, by the unknowns, they did not have faith to understand the importance of what was happening at the time. Again, they thought they knew, but they didn't, but it was what they didn't know that was the most difficult. Now, on the other side of history where we live, where we have all of this told to us very clearly, we know what they did not know at the time, that Jesus, though disappointing him at the moment, was fulfilling God's ultimate plan to deal with the oppression of sin forever for all people in all time. The unknowns of their day are the knowns of our day. And these knowns are pretty amazing. There's so much that God has allowed us to know through the revelation of the scripture. We know that we have forgiveness of sin from all our past and present sins. We know that because of that, we have an intimate relationship with God. We know that the scriptures tell us that at that moment of salvation, at that time, we have a deposit of the Holy Spirit in us that begins the process of transforming our lives and testifying that we are children of God. We know that we have the Word of God to show us the light and the way and the truth. We know that God gave us the church, the fellowship of the saints, so we could nurture each other, support each other, and grow as a spiritual family. And ultimately, we know that we have the promise of eternal life, that the life we experience, even with all of its sorrows and trials, is only a small blip on the screen compared to what is waiting for us. These are pretty amazing knowns. These are things that they didn't know at the time, we know now. So, even though we, this is a good list, list of knowns, there are things in the Bible um, that we are known to be followers of Jesus. It's easy to take these knowns, these truths that I just, it's easy to take them for granted. And often the most challenging part of our faith are the unknowns in our life. We can say to ourselves, yes, you've given me all these things. I've testified that it's true. I've experienced that it's true. I've literally been born again in Christ. But why do I still have to suffer? Why do the people I love have to suffer? Why aren't my prayers being answered? Why am I so unclear about my future? Why are not all my hopes and dreams being fulfilled? Why can't I get a job? Why can't I find a spouse? When will there ever be justice in the world? The list goes on and on. The unknowns, the things that God has just told us that we have to wait for in faith can haunt us and challenge our faith and make us wonder and doubt. So I have to ask the question, brutally honest question, do you ever find yourself disappointed with Jesus? Like he might not be coming through like he said he was going to come through? I had a conversation with a very close friend yesterday, a spiritual mentor of mine, whose life has been crushed for many, many years through a combination of physical pain that he can't get out of, relationship challenges, and he is... 70, and just a broken, broken person right now. And all he kept saying was, I have to keep trusting God to come through. I have to keep trusting God to come through. Um, he is really disappointed, but he hasn't shaken his belief in God. And he has every right 
<laughs> to be disappointed. Um, it's pretty amazing to just see somebody clinging on to that. So have you ever found yourself thinking that Jesus should be one way and he turned out to be another? Have you been disappointed when your prayers weren't answered or he seemed distant and far away or you're not getting what you want in your life? You know, it's tempting to think about Jesus as utilitarian. He's there to help us, give us what we want and what we need. Someone there that we can pray to and it will just help us. Now, I had a personal very embarrassing experience with this early on in my life. I was a Christian, maybe a year, maybe less. I was in my 20s. And I believed very, very strongly what the Scripture says. And the Scripture said, anything you ask of my name, I will give it to you. So I decided to give it a try. I said, Lord, what I really want is a Toyota long bed pickup <laughs> with a shell, and I can only afford this amount of money. I claim it by faith. <laughs> then I went out and found it. And I bought it. Forgot to tell my wife. <laughs> but after all, I was following the Holy Spirit. And that was like, wow. This really is true. And I, then I started claiming the house down on the end of the corner. <laughs> Somehow it wasn't working out. Now I know for a fact that if God was orchestrating that answer to the prayer, it wasn't because I wanted that truck so bad or I needed it. It was, it was his way as an early Christian to say, you can trust me. But I quickly learned that he was not a genie in a bottle for my wishes. And then over time, he begins to teach you to pray for and ask for the things he wants to give you. Peace with God, reconciliation with God, peace, wisdom, strength and suffering, faith for the unknown, not trucks. <laughs> Though I was immensely grateful. <laughs> and by the way, gave it quite a testimony for quite a long time until I got convicted. Yeah, maybe that's not the best story. So, as followers of Jesus, we are challenged to view and accept Jesus as he really is, not as we want him to be. We submit to him and his lordship. We don't ask him to submit to our wants and needs. John 12, 26 says, whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, my servant will also be. My Father will honor one who serves me. This verse puts the order correctly. We serve Jesus, he doesn't serve us. In his love and grace, he, he, he blesses us. But a follower of Jesus who understands the knowns says, got it, I will now serve you. I will allow you to be God, not me. I will submit myself to that authority in all the ways that I can. Having an accurate and clear understanding requires us to realize that he is a king of a kingdom. But that kingdom, the kingdom of God, often can be referred to as an upside-down kingdom. So much of what Jesus commands us as followers to believe and practice can be very counterintuitive. In order to gain your life, you must lose it. That's a tough one. I know a lot of people who stumbled right there. I don't want to lose my life. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it um, for eternal life. So that's counterintuitive. He who wants to be first should be last. Counterintuitive. Do not hate your enemies. Love your enemies. Hmm. Blessed are the poor, for they will inherit the kingdom of God. Do not seek and hoard riches, 
but be, 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 become hilarious givers of your financial resources. I used to tell my kids that because of the way we believe, we live differently. And that means we practice the principles of worship, of generosity, of service, of giving up our rights for the rights of others. This is what it means to live in an upside down kingdom, is to be able to say, I don't get it, there's a lot I don't know, but I will trust and submit that this is the way. And I know most of us, if not all of us in this room, can testify that when you enter into that counterintuitive of the unknowns and receive it, it all becomes clear and becomes a great blessing. A proper view of Jesus challenges us, again, to think against our own ideas and especially what the world, the culture around us, tells us what to do and what to think. These are challenging things to incorporate in our life. Um, but to do them, we have to exercise something called faith and trust. In our faith, in the Christian faith, faith is the bridge between what we know and what we don't know. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is at the end of 1 Corinthians 13 where it says, for now we know in part. For now we see through a glass darkly. What we think we know is a bit skewed by what we don't know. If God said, okay, here it, is, here it all is. You could have all the knowledge that I have, our heads would explode. But the vanity of man demands to know the mind of God. So we have to find a place where we have the faith with the unknowns until God chooses to allow us to understand. Hebrews 11 says this, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, for the convictions of th things not seen. That's unknown. For by the people of old received their condemnation, their commendation, not condemnation. I mean, Abraham was the classic. He believed by faith. God reckoned to him as righteousness. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and rewards those who earnestly seek him. Faith is the key. In a rational world that we live in, often people stop right there and say, I can't have faith. They call it blind faith. It's not blind faith. God has given plenty of reason to make it what I call a reasonable faith. When we set out on this road towards our spiritual knowns in Christ, we do it in faith, in the goodness with the unknowns. Because our faith is not in an idea. It's not even in a religion. Our faith is in a living God who demonstrated he could be trusted with our lives and the destiny of all creation. He demonstrated he could be trusted with all this when he obediently climbed onto the donkey and rode into Jerusalem. Our trust for the unknowns, for the questions we don't have answered, for all the things that that confuse us and we struggle with is in Jesus himself. Because the one thing that we do know is that he can be trusted. As we do our best to obediently walk in what I call the known unknowns, we are not being asked to suffer and die. We're not being asked to be crucified and we're not being asked to be arrested and to be tried unjustly. We're just being asked to put our trust in the one who did. So with all that context, how should we feel about Palm Sunday? There's a lot to celebrate in this story and a lot to celebrate with the coming events of this week that we are working hard as a church to celebrate. There's also a lot to mourn in this story with all the events coming. 
There's a lot in this story that can make us feel confused as it exposes some of the unknowns. But for me personally, when I get it all together and think about it, I mostly feel grateful. Grateful for what Jesus did for me and for all of us. I also feel awe about who actually came to do this. Sometimes we take that for granted with the flannel graph. And we need to allow it to seek into our hearts. Who came to do this? Ultimate love. I also feel the tension of believing the conflict between what I know and what I don't know and what I have to trust him for. I want to be sober-minded and humble, but I also want to celebrate. So how should we feel on Palm Sunday? I think the most honest response is the one given by people who greeted Jesus at that historic moment when they cried out, Hosanna in the highest. He is our Savior. He does save us. And that is worthy of proclaiming, and that is worthy of celebrating. In this, we can rejoice and celebrate. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, as a church, we gather together to honor you, to acknowledge to ourselves, to you, to the heavenly realm, that we proclaim you, Lord Jesus, as the King of kings, the Lord of lords. It is who you we worship solely. We thank you for our presence that you have promised is here with us. Father, I ask you and the Holy Spirit to move in our hearts this week to allow us to find the space and the time to think about these events, to let them deep into our soul, to be blessed by them, Lord. And that we would continue to trust you with the things in our life that we're not sure about. The things in our life that may be confusing. The things in our life that are hurtful. The things in our life that we're waiting for you to deal with and just not happening. Help us find the faith, at least for the day, for the moment, often, to trust and believe in you and all these things. Father God, we pray these things in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. So let me invite you to stand. First of all, thank you for coming once again. Next week is Easter. We'll celebrate immensely. If you are here today and you're new or you've been here a little bit and you haven't been able to connect yet, um, at the end of the service in the back, there's a welcome table with some people there waiting to welcome you and to greet you and answer your questions. And I think we're still giving away gifts. I don't know, maybe we are. I think we are. Um, You know, so go out and find out, right? Um, So... um, Let me leave you as a benediction um, with the words of Jesus himself coming from the same passage we're looking at today, John 12. Jesus cried out and said, whoever believes in me believes not in me, but he who sent me. And whoever sees him who sent me, whoever sees me sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light so that ever, whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. That's worth celebrating. Praise God. Go in peace. Amen.